This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you are listening on. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King. From Penn State Athletics, Kevin Adams. And Legacy Battle Zone movie specialist, Stephen King. Our special guest tonight, we're joined by an actress, writer, producer. She's got all those hats uh, on it sometimes. She's had breakout role in the movie right here. Breakout role in Fireproof, of course which was the highest grossing independent film uh, the year that it was released. She starred in probably more than this, but I got 36 films and counting, including New Life, Sunrise in Heaven, Miracles on Christmas. She also has several in post and pre-production to be released in the, the next year or so. So we got actress Erin Bethay here. Erin, thank you for coming on. Yay, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is gonna be great. I mean. We only get so many film debates on our show, so we always enjoy them when we, we get them. But uh, so tonight's debate, if you can't tell by the actress we have here, is going to be the greatest faith-based sports film. Uh, she has uh, appeared in one of them, of course, so we'll get to that one eventually here. But we're going to start this out tonight with uh, Overcomer. Overcomer, I really enjoyed this movie. Uh, directed by Alex Kendrick, co-wrote uh, the script with his uh, relative Stephen Kendrick, uh, it's the Kendrick Brothers' uh, sixth film released by Sony Pictures um, uh, through their label, Affirm Films. It came out August 23rd, 2019. It actually grossed $38 million worldwide against only a $5 million budget, uh, giving them an A-plus on cinema score. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, so the coach John Harrison, played by Alex Kendrick, he's a basketball coach at the high school. Uh, the town basically survives on a manufacturing plant that is actually being moved to another town. Um, all the good basketball players on his team were moving with the plant because of, of their parents working for the plant. Um, so the principal tells John that the school's losing teachers, losing coaches. So they wanted him to coach the uh, cross country team because uh, they don't want to lose another school program. So he goes to the tryouts. Only one child <laughs> shows up uh, to the tryouts. Her name's Hannah. Um, she's asthmatic on top of being the only person to show up. Um, she lives with her grandmother uh, who has been telling her that both of her parents are dead, um, and she actually has a problem with stealing items from other students as well as teachers. Uh, so the coach was helping uh, the pastor at his church the one day do visits at the hospital, and he actually entered a room accidentally, uh, and that in that room happened to be this child's father, um, Thomas Hill. Thomas had abandoned Hannah uh, and her mother when she was a baby, um, so that's how she ended up uh, living with the grandmother, and the grandmother trying to protect the child from being hurt by him. Um, the mother was deceased, though, uh, and John did find out that the actual principal of the school was good friends with Hannah's mother. Um, she was actually paying the child's tuition costs uh, to go to their school. Um, so John tells Hannah about her father, uh, who actually ended up being a really good cross-country runner. Um, throughout the movie, she's you know reluctant to visit him. She starts visiting him more. She starts building uh, trust in him, trust in her faith, uh, starts coming back. She actually returns the items that she had stolen uh, throughout the cross-country season. She's gradually getting better, getting better, uh, and then she makes it to the state championship finals where she's going up against the defending state champ. Well, the coach met up with her father and has to kind of give her some motivation and encouragement, and actually went through the whole track with him, um, and he recorded his voice, giving her encouragement, based on what time the coach thought she would be at on each spot of the track, uh, which was, that's pretty inspirational. It, it built her up uh, throughout the race, um, and she ended up winning the, the state championship, beating the defending state champ, um, which, you know, it just, it's very uplifting. The father, unfortunately, ends up passing. Uh, he was blind and had diabetic issues, and he was in the hospital during the whole movie. Um, but later on, she tells her story to her friends um, about her cross-country experience. Um, and then it ends the movie with her running through uh, the streets of the city that she's living in. And it's her 21st birthday, and she puts on a recording. And it's her dad saying, it's now your 21st birthday. And so he had pre-recorded uh, some video recordings or audio recordings for her to listen to as she grew up. Um, but it's very... Very inspirational. Uh, it's got the faith uh, base in it for sure. Uh, she definitely, you see her grow in, in her uh, walk with Christ. Um, very good sports movie. She's the underdog and comes out on top. Uh, so it's definitely a great movie. 
So, Aaron, you've worked with the Kendricks a couple times. I mean, they are the tops of the faith-based film industry. When they release a movie, it's usually the top grossing faith-based film of the year. So what was your experience working with them and what were your thoughts on, on the movie Overcomer? Yeah, um, it's it's hard to speak to any of these films objectively um, <laughs> because the faith-based film community is so small. The film community is so small, really. Hollywood's a very small town, but the faith-based community is this, this little byproduct of that. Um, and so there are like people I love involved in all of these films. So I always have to, I like look at it through that lens too. Um, I mean, the Kendricks are, here's what I will say about them, just even beyond sort of their uh, amazing ability to tell a story that um, has this great, always has this great faith through line. They always have great humor in their films. Um, they, they, all, you will always feel all the feelings in a Kendrick Brothers movie. You will laugh, you will cry, and you will like cheer on your feet at some point. Um, that's just like a natural through line with their movies. Um, but beyond that, they're really just really brilliant in terms of knowing their audience. Um, I think sort of in the faith film world, they've got a very specific group of believers um, who are sort of die hard and they want the Kendrick Brothers movie experience <laughs> every time, no matter what, like that's what they love. You know, it's sort of the same thing that like, you know, Tyler Perry has that, right? Like there's like, they're the people want the Tyler Perry movie experience. People want a Kendrick Brothers movie experience. Um, and so they're, they're so good at serving their audience in that way. Um, while also, like I said, just telling a story that makes you feel all the feelings. And, and what'd you think of Overcomer? Uh, I loved Overcomer. It's, um, it's funny because this one actually had lots of my friends in it, even though it wasn't, um, you know, made in my hometown the way that a lot of the other converts brothers movies were um but I loved it I thought it was um of course Cameron Arnett for me is he's such a tremendous actor who who plays the father Mr. Hill um he's such a phenomenal actor and he just his voice is so wonderful so like hearing his voice in Hannah's ear on that track he's got such a lovely like tone to his voice as an actor I thought that role was cast really well um, and it was really nostalgic for me to watch Alex Kendrick play a coach again, um, just because that's, you know, that's uh, facing the Giants, which I know we'll talk about, um, is a personal memory for me. So I really enjoyed it. I, I always enjoy their films. I think, um, I think, you know, there were a few, there are a few things I know they got a little blowback on in this film. They got a little blowback from like, well, should a stranger tell a kid you know, that their grandmother's been lying to them <laughs> this whole time. Um, and I completely understand that. And I also think, you know, it's a fictional story and it's a suspension of disbelief and it's, it's still good storytelling. Well, let's hit up our other Kendricks film tonight, Facing the Giants. All right, Facing the Giants. Um, come out in 2006, the football movie uh, ended up 10.2 million at the box office. Uh, early on, you meet Coach Grant Taylor, um, who is the head coach for Shiloh High School, a uh, school in Georgia, played by Alex Kendrick. Um, and he is immediately hit with uh, disappointment. He loses his best player to a rival school because it's not believed that Shiloh uh, can produce you know, good college prospects. Um, so that's a blow right there. And, th and then he's hit with a series of disappointments, which are – Really, I quite frankly, very emasculating for him. Um, uh, his home uh, has several issues. Um, his his car barely runs. He just discovers a conspiracy to to strip him of his coaching job, and to top it all off, uh, tests confirm that it's him. He's the reason that him and his wife cannot start a family. Um, oh, and by the way, he also the team starts off zero and three. So this is just blow after blow for this guy. Um, you know, things reach this, the, the, you know, this low, helpless point, and the coach, he turns to his faith. Um, there's a scene I really liked uh, with a guy named Mr. Bridges, 
um, he faithfully would pray for each uh, over each player's locker and pray for you know for their safety and for their, their development in Christ and and um, he told the coach some profound words you know he said there there are two farmers praying for rain one who prepares his fields and one who does not which are you and this really you know rang true for the coach um, you know he he changes his entire approach to coaching the team with this renewed purpose after this. Um, there was a very, very memorable scene. You can see a picture behind me of the team captain, Brock. He's carrying another player on his back doing what they call a death crawl. Um, the coach, he blindfolds Brock. He, he, he wants him, to, he wants him to, to, to crawl as far as he can without thinking about the distance. Um, you know, and he ends up crawling the whole entire length of the field, which just – you know, drove home this lesson to just do your best and leave the results up to the Almighty. Um, and so as things turn out, all of the curses in Coach Grant's life turn out to be blessings. And ultimately, uh, it sets up this David versus Goliath showdown in the state championship. Uh, David a- actually also happens to be the name of the of the, the team's kicker. Um, and he has his own sort of inspirational um, uh, subplot as well. There's also a nice subplot in this with uh, a kid, Matt, and his dad. Um, they, they, they struggled in their relationship, and, and, and that ends up being resolved. And then another thing to note, uh, Shannon Fields, uh, who plays the coach's wife, she does an excellent, excellent job in this movie. And her character uh, shows, like, just remarkable patience and loyalty. I mean, I think any guy would just would, you know, would absolutely want to have this in, in a partner for sure. Uh, and there's also a, uh, a cameo appearance uh, by former Georgia Bulldogs coach uh, Mark Richt in this as well. So uh, just an excellent, excellent movie all the way around. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. Aaron, you probably went to church with everybody in this film. Uh, and I believe it's your first acting uh, appearance in a film, if I'm correct on that. Yeah. And, the, and then the, the production value from Flywheel to Facing the Giants went through the roof. So just... Tell us about that movie. You were part of it. Let, let's hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, this one definitely, I mean, it holds a special place in my heart. It's That's my high school that I went to, that those scenes are shot on. Um, I, I do maintain, you know, of course, I mean, this is the Kendrick Brothers, the second movie they ever made, right? So from a from a quality standpoint, when you compare it to like some of the other films that we're talking about, today it, it you know they made it for, it's a hundred thousand dollar budget you know <laughs> um but i maintain that that death crawl scene has got to be one of the best scenes in any sports movie ever i mean it, it's just yeah. so inspirational and i know it's been used like in motivational motivational speeches all over the country and stuff and there's there's a reason um it's unbelievable um yeah it's it's fun this one's like almost like going back to watch this movie is almost like going back to look through your high school yearbook um it's full of lots of memories and lots of people that I've known my whole life and um places that I've eaten at my whole life and all that sort of stuff but um and Shannon you're right Shannon does such a tremendous job in this film and she was actually the high school football coach's wife at the high school so that's like very very much a relatable um position for her at the time and um yeah I just think the film is really sweet and I know it's so crazy how involved I actually was in the process without intending to be so involved because the Kendricks had made Flywheel which I still think is a is a terrible movie that's a great story <laughs> um, like not not a great movie but the story is it's my favorite great message a great message yeah the story is so it's my favorite of all the kendrick movies it's the best story um but uh but they had made flywheel and i was actually working in orlando um for this place called the creative outbreak workshop and we were going to be going and meeting with these guys that were making all these films and videos in Orlando, these gentlemen named David Nixon and Bob Scott. And I had said to Alex, you should come down to this and meet these guys because they're believers and they're doing really great stuff. And I'm interning in this program. 
And so he and Stephen came down and gave Mr. Nixon a copy of Flywheel. And that's how David and Bob Scott, who was the DP on Facing the Giants and Fireproof and War Room and Overcomer, um, that's how they all met. So it was really cool. I was like in the room when that first meeting happened just because I knew the Kendricks and was interning for this other company. Um, and then ended up doing that little, you know, three line reporter part <laughs> in, in facing the giants. Um, so yeah, it's, it was a fun journey to see them sort of take that huge step forward is a big step to go from like, just kind of asking their friends to help them on the weekends to shoot flywheel to actually hiring and bringing in some professional crew members to help them make a, a legitimate movie. Um, and that gamble majorly paid off. I mean, when Sony picked that thing up, we all were like, like Sony, Sony, like, we, <laughs> you know, we were like, is this like Sony with an E Y or something, you know? Um, so it was, uh, it was a very exciting time when that film got made and released. And the late great coach, Dan Reeves, Brian, I know you know who that is. He uh, said that that was like the best football film he's ever seen. So that, that's some high praise great from a, a what should be a Hall of Fame coach. We'll see if he gets in here in the later years. But hey, I, I got a quick question. Just a quick question. Yeah. Did, did Brock actually do the whole field or was that just, you know, uh, I, little segments? I think he actually ended up crawling the whole field by the end of that. Uh, by the end of that day, Jason McLeod, who who plays Brock in that scene and who was also in, in Fireproof with me. Um, he's just an incredible, that guy was an insane high school athlete. Um, I think he was in college at the time that we shot that film but he just has he's he's unbelievably strong um and he is the type of guy who he would have crawled that whole field <laughs> you know if the coach had told him to he's got an insane work ethic that guy does well let's move to our our only hollywood based film tonight and that's going to be soul surfer so the movie i had was soul surfer uh it was filmed in hawaii in 2010 it has tons of hollywood stars in it uh dennis quaid helen hunt Kevin Sorbo, who was Hercules, and then Anna Sophia Robb, who plays uh, Bethany, the main character. She was also in Bridge to Terabithia, which is one of my favorite movies growing up. Um, was very impressed with all the performances in this movie. Um, the movie is about a surfer who gets attacked by a shark and loses her arm, which was a very crazy story. I was not expecting it. I tried to go into this movie with open eyes and not knowing anything about it. Um, I thought it was kind of ironic because there's the old, you know, saying where like mom and dad tell you not to do something and there's probably a good reason why. And her, her father's actually getting knee surgery and she goes out to go surfing at night and gets attacked by a shark. <laughs> so um, she was became placed first and third in the first regional competition that she had surfed in. So, I mean, she was a prospect, you know, on her way to be one of the greatest surfers in the world. And obviously growing up and living in Hawaii has an awesome opportunity to do that. Um, because of this accident, uh, you know, she kind of gets inundated by paparazzi and the news and even inside edition, they offer to give her a prosthetic arm and she figures out that it'll weight her down too much to ever try surfing again. So she turns it down. So there's a lot of moments in this movie. I feel like for Anna Sophia Robb were strong acting moments where really she had to take the lead and, uh, the way she responds to the reporters and some of the adversity is going through it's, phenomenal performance uh, from her. I was very, very impressed. Um, and in the end of the movie, uh, there's a, a big competition. Uh, she goes out, her dad helps rig her this device that helps her pop up on the surfboard um, uh, with one arm. And she goes out and she rides the, the biggest wave there at the competition, but technically she came in a little bit too late, so she didn't actually win. But uh, her rival in the surfing competition earlier, she invites her up uh, on the platform for the first place ceremony and everything which I thought was kind of beautiful and inspirational it was kind of cool because a lot of sports movies you see um end in a way where the star wins and everything kind of works out for them and and this this movie did, really didn't end that way but it was still just as inspirational um and you saw how she was still on that same level um uh professionally speaking even you know going through the disability that she did and uh, the way that, you know, she leaned on her uh, faith uh, and her family did in certain points of time in the movie was was very inspirational as well. I love any sports film that has the bad news bears ending where the good guys lose. Yes, exactly. that is always great. So, Aaron, 
with this film. He mentioned Kevin Sorbo in it. He may have more faith-based film appearances than you. I, I, I don't know. He's got a hundred of them at least. But So yeah. Hollywood films, sometimes we see that they take the faith aspect out of things. We saw it in, in some movies we were talking about before we started, uh, Noah and Exodus, to name a few. They, they totally took that aspect out of it. How do you think this film did with that? And it's a true story. I mean, your, your, your thoughts on the film. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I love a true story and that those are my favorite movies, anything based on a true story. And one thing that I thought, uh, just, it was interesting when I was looking at these, the list of these films that we're talking about today is that two of them are true stories and two of them are not. And the two that are true stories, both times the good guys lose. Yeah. Um, yeah. because that's life. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because we can write the perfect happy ending and it's and it's awesome and it's exciting. But in life, sometimes even as much faith as we have, we still don't get everything that we try for and go for in this life. Mm -hmm. um, and the point is like still having faith in spite of that. Right. Um, so that's I loved that about this film. Right. Right, is that uh, every every step of the way, even though we do see her struggling, you know, we see her, um, Bethany saying, why is this happening to me? Why is this the path that God chose for me? We still see her choosing, even in the midst of losing, she loses a lot <laughs> in, this, yeah. in this film. Not just right? an arm. Right, exactly. It starts with the arm and then continues. She, she loses multiple competitions. She loses the final competition, you know, and in the face of it all with, with just no guarantees and only sort of her faith in the support of her family, she perseveres. Um, and those are really inspirational stories to me. And then, you know, I think part of the reason that we can give some credit to this film, even being a Hollywood film, maintaining its faith point of view is because of Bethany, um, you know, her being still around and being able to speak into the film, I think she probably made it very clear that if this was going to be done, if a movie was going to be made about her life, that her faith needed to be depicted in it, right? Um, if Noah were still alive, he would be pushing for the same thing, but he's not. So Hollywood gets to do whatever they want with his story. Um, so I think, you know, that's just a testament to her and her family and sort of um, not being enamored by the idea of Hollywood making a movie about her life, but but saying if it's going to happen, it has to authentically show what I believe. Um, yeah. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it's to me, it was definitely probably the most challenging movie to make just just from a logistical standpoint of any of the films that we saw, all the water, all the work in the water, all the, you know, special effects with the missing arm and all that. I just thought this was a, this was a much more challenging movie than some of the other ones. And, and on the whole, I'm going to say that this film had the best acting tonight. When we look at the whole cast, I'm going to, I'm going to give the nod to, to Soul Surfer on that, but it should with the cast that it had. <laughs> right. Know, right. <laughs> right. Well, let's move into our, our final film tonight, and we're going back to the gridiron. So I know that makes Brian happy, our football guru here. But uh, it's called Woodlawn, 2015 film, budget of $13 million. It brought in $14 million. So when you add in, you know, costs to advertise it and everything, it, it didn't make any money. I'm, I'll be honest with that. But it has definitely gained, gained a hold on, on the Christian community. This movie has the feel almost of Remember the Titans, kind of along the same lines here. Um, stars Sean Astin, who, of course, is remembered from The Goonies and uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy there. Nick Bishop, John Voight, C. Thomas Howe, Wolverines, Red Dawn right there, and Sherry Shepard. It's got a cinema score of A+. So the fans certainly loved it, um, and it's still holding 73% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is a pretty decent score. So... Um, movies based on a true story, 1973, the gover government mandated uh, desegregation, and this takes place in Woodlawn High School, which is in Alabama, so saying Alabama and, and desegregation kind of gives the story here of where we're going. Um, it didn't go over so well at this high school when it occurred. There was, there was acts of violence, not just in school, but throughout the city. Um, Coach Geralds, he played, he's played by Bishop. He brings in an outsider, Chaplain Hank Aaron, who's played by Sean Astin, who gives us just an inspirational speech about love, hope, faith, and, and 
inspires most of the team to accept Christ right then and there. And it was a fantastic scene. Very well done. I love it. Um, and this message really hits uh, an African-American player hard. Like it hits him, hits him in the heart. Running back Tony Nathan, who would later go on. He, this is a true story. He would later play for Bear Bryant at Alabama, who was played by John Boyd. And he would go on to play in two Super Bowls with the Miami Dolphins. So he had quite, quite a career. But so after this, he accepts Christ. He becomes a model student. And the coach, after a first week loss, puts him in at running back. And it changes the fortunes of the team. Um, all of a sudden, they, they become very, very good. Um, eventually, the, the white and black players on the team, they unify. They become a powerhouse. Coach Gerald, who was like the last holdout to to accept Christ, he does this after the team loses the championship game, and because um, he has seen like the change in in his players and the, and the, the men that they have become. Um, and like I said, they did lose the championship game, which was something we just mentioned earlier about how much we like seeing reality, which is always nice. Um, so after that, they lose though. Um, they lose to a team called Banks High, and they, they played very dirty. They knocked Nathan out after he scored a touchdown on a, a very late hit, knocked him out for injury. Um, but they decide in that offseason to get together with the Banks team, and they have a co-practice, which was something that, like, had never really happened before. And the players uh, from Nathan's team there from Woodlawn help lead the team from Banks to Christ. And it's just it's a beautiful moment. And um, they end up having joint practices throughout. And then the season starts and both teams go undefeated and they face each other again in, in the next championship, which it's just a great story all around. Um, another NFL player who was on the Woodlawn team was quarterback Jeff Rutledge. Um, so he was uh, part of that team as well. Just a fantastic movie. Aaron, we're, we're, we're com comparing it to all four movies tonight, but we also got to say – you know, kind of compared to facing the Giants as well. So uh, yeah. and a pretty good cast. Uh, I always like Sean Astin. He's been getting involved with more and more faith-based films recently. So your thoughts on this film? Uh, this is actually probably my favorite of the four. Um, it's it's the one that I, I don't understand how it didn't do better than it did. I, just, I think it was maybe a, maybe a mistake with how it was marketed because the film itself – is, is it's facing the Giants meets Remember the Titans. Like, right. it, I mean, which are both great football movies. So how can this one not be amazing, right? Um, and it's based on a true story, which I've already said is, is my favorite stuff. Um, and I'm also, I'm just a huge fan of the Irwin brothers. I have never worked with them on a film, but I've known them for a really long time. And I love every single one of their movies. And one of the things I think about them that, is different from like the Kendrick brothers is you can watch all the Irwin brothers movies and you'd never know they were made by the same people. Um, they're all so different and so unique, you know, October baby and Woodlawn couldn't, couldn't feel like more different movies. Um, and uh, so I love it. I love this movie. I love Caleb. He's a friend. So I think he's tremendous. Um, and then Sean and I've worked together before we've played husband and wife. And so I'm a little bit biased because Sean and, you know, who doesn't want to see Rudy in another football movie? Um, right, right. <laughs> so I don't know. I love this film. I think it's beautifully shot. Um, the football footage is like gorgeous in this movie. Um, and I think the race issues are handled with just the right amount of like, grit but also care knowing that you know they're still trying to play to a to a faith audience and so sometimes the tendency when you're when you're marketing to a faith audience is to sort of gloss some difficult things over or make them seem like you know god just makes it all okay um and i like that they kind of dig into some of the messiness of of that issue in this film because it it deserves to be shown for as messy as it was um, so yeah, I think, I think the movie's beautiful. I love that. I love that they lose the big game at the end. I'm a big fan of imperfect endings. <laughs> so what can I say? Well, our shout outs tonight, the films that just missed tonight's list, uh, the mighty max greater and American underdog, um, all solid films. There are reasons why each didn't make it tonight, but let's move into our vote. Guys cannot vote for your own. Brian, you're my upper corner. Who are you taking? 
and this is a this is a really difficult decision. Um, I think I'm uh, I'm gonna go uh, I'm gonna go Woodlawn on this one. I I really like um, hey, yeah, how deep of the message that uh, portrays there. Okay, Kevin. Um, I just want to point out that Overcomer does have the biggest profit out of all the movies we're talking about this night. <laughs> Always <laughs> arguing <laughs> after the arguments are over. Uh, I'm, I'm known for that. I always do that. Um, no, I really like uh, Facing the Giants. I'm going to have to go with that one. That one, uh, I enjoyed that. And actually, I, seeing Brock do that death crawl, uh, no joke, I actually tried that with one of my friends immediately after I saw that movie. <laughs> uh, it's no joke. That, that death crawl sucks, but <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with Facing the Giants. Steven? Uh, I'm going to have to say Woodlawn as well. It was really great to see Sean Astin and another football movie it's very inspirational I, I have to also agree with Aaron's point that it was very gritty um they got into some of the tough elements of what was going on in the south at that point in time um and and not in they didn't divulge it or gloss it over they just told the story and I thought the message was extremely inspirational and, and I have to agree with you know what she said the realistic uh, outcome of it and that things didn't exactly work out the way that everyone thought that they would but it still had a satisfactory ending. I have to go with Woodlawn. So coming in tonight, knowing that I can't vote for my own, I, I was torn between Soul Surfer and Facing the Giants. And I, I give the nod to, to Soul Surfer for acting, for sure. And But I, I like football better than surfing, so that, that, <laughs> might, be why, that might be why I'm leaning towards Facing the Giants. So I am going to go Facing the Giants. So... Aaron, we come to you, and I know this is going to be really hard for you because uh, you were in Facing the Giants, <laughs> but you said Woodlawn's kind of your, your, your favorite film, so you got to break our tie, or you can vote for one of the other ones. I know. Can I tell you what's wild about this is, so I'm in one of these movies, but of the four, my dad is actually the executive producer on both of these that we're talking oh, about. Oh, wow. <laughs> Woodlawn and Facing the Giants. Um, so I'm biased either way. Um, but yeah, I think I have to go with Woodlawn. I mean, a true story wins out for me almost every time. Um, and I mean, I've, I love, I have a huge special place in my heart for Facing the Giants. But um, as far as a movie that I think is easy for me to recommend to a lot of people, um, from different backgrounds and different points of view, too. I think Woodlawn is one that is, appeals to a really broad audience. Um, and it just, it just delivers every time. Plus, you know, I love John Voight in that, in that <laughs> Bear Bryant hat. So, <laughs> I, And I thought he did a really good job as Bear oh, Bryant. I, I thought yeah. he kind of nailed it. So, that, yeah, that was good. All right. Oh, so a win for Woodlawn tonight. That is a, a win for me, which... Hey, that means I get first question. Doesn't happen often. So let's move into our Q&A here for Aaron. So I, I, I brought this one out here for a reason. So my, my first question here tonight is Fireproof is one of the rare Christian films. This is what I love about it, too. Rare Christian films where after the, the star, Caleb Kirk Cameron, finds Christ, things don't get better right away. And that is what I really appreciate about this film because most Christian films, they find Christ, everything changes, and everything's just hunky-dory great. Doesn't happen in this film. You actually give him the divorce papers after he finds Christ. I thought that was fantastically written. So I just I just kind of wanted to hear your, you know, your your thoughts on that film. It it is one of my wife and I's favorite films. We've we've gotten the love there and we have given it to people to help with their relationships. So just uh, tell me what it was like to be part of that film. Thank you so much. I, I mean, like, it's so funny. We made this film in 2007, right? It released in 2008. And I still never get tired of talking about it because it was such a life-changing experience for me. And then watching it have an impact on so many other people, even still. Like, the idea that a, that a just a movie about a bad marriage, <laughs> essentially has held up now for, you know, over 15 years or whatever it is, is, is kind of insane. 
Um, yeah, I think uh, I get a lot of flack from people who don't like that I didn't get nice to Kirk once he got <laughs> saved. So I'm glad that you appreciate that. <laughs> that. That's real life. It's like losing yeah. a big game at the end. Exactly. That's what it's like. Exactly. I get I get a lot of flack from it. Like, why couldn't you just have been? I think it's the they just don't want to see anybody be mean to Mike Seaver. So, um, <laughs> but no, that uh, I I mean I'm so proud of that film. I, you know, with for for what we did it for, and um, the fact really that that Kirk, of course, was the only one with significant on camera experience. I had done a ton of theater um before that and was working professionally in the theater but had not spent you know the most I'd ever done on camera prior to fireproof was that little talking direct to camera and facing the giants bit so um I think the the movies the product speaks for itself in terms of how it's held up and how it's translated to to people they see themselves in it um I've had so many people tell me you know that fight scene in the kitchen like that's they have lived that exact fight with their spouse so many times. Um, and I think that's really, I think w for us as actors and as storytellers, that's our only goal is to have people sort of see a reflection of humanity in the entertainment that they're, that they're watching. If they can't relate to it, then they can't get invested in it. Well, and you guys, you nailed the details in that movie. Even the scene where you're crying, trying to put makeup on, <laughs> and you're like stop crying because you can't put makeup on when you're crying i mean you guys nailed even the little details perfectly done Thank you. awesome Thank um, you. yeah so uh we'll go steve and brian kevin all right um aaron you've gotten to work with some of uh you know hollywood's best a-list you were just mentioning earlier you were married to sean astin in a film um has there ever been any moment where you had, you know, a fangirl moment with a certain actor or actress where you had to kind of catch yourself a little bit saying, oh, wow, this is this person and, and I'm, we're working together. I mean, you've done a very good job being professional and great. But have you ever had a, any moment like that where you were just a little bit intimidated by someone? Um, a couple times, actually. I mean, I don't... Um... When it's people that I'm working with, it's a little easier. If I'm just meeting, so like I got to meet Dolly Parton at, at an award show and I completely was an <laughs> idiot. I mean, just, you know, she's a legend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you're working with people, it's at least a little bit easier because there's kind of this peer thing. Um, but Sean Astin was probably the first actor that I worked with that I got. Uh, I just, when I found out that he was cast, I was already cast. And when I found out that he was cast, um, the director of that, that film was Kevin Downs, who actually produced Woodlawn uh, also. And when I found out Sean was cast, I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. I like, love Lord of the Rings. And so I was just like, oh my gosh, Samwise Ganji. Like I was <laughs> so excited. Um, and of course he couldn't have been a lovelier human being. Um, and then getting to work um, in New Life, we actually cast Terry O'Quinn um, in that film, who was John Locke on Lost. Um, yeah, yeah. Just such a tremendous, you know, he was in The Rocketeer and Stepfather. He's just such an incredible actor. And I've just been a fan of his work for so long. Um, and so he stepped on set and talk about a just lovely professional guy. He stepped on set and immediately he knew who I was. He knew I had been a co-writer on the script. He told me how much he loved the story and was so excited to be there. Um, we were like goofing off between, cause our scene was super serious, um, like getting really terrible news and really heavy and emotional. So in between takes, he was playing Bruno Mars and we were dancing. <laughs> um, so he, he was one that I was initially like sort of very intimidated by because I love his work so much. And of course he turned out to be an incredible human. So that's awesome. Uh, first off, I mean, you mentioned new life. I want to say I, I watched that movie uh, here recently and I thought it was very well done. Um, beautiful story. Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to know was, was this inspired by, by a true story? And 
And then also I got to know, you know, how difficult was it for them to, uh, you know, for you to allow them to shave your head? That had to be, <laughs> I know how women are with their hair. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so to answer your first question, it wasn't, um, based on a true story, but it was more so, uh, my, my now husband drew waters. It was really, the story was kind of just inspired. Um, he lost his grandfather, who was his very best friend, closest person in his life, um, and just really had a lot of trouble with the grief process and the, you know, sort of, you know, why does this, his grandfather actually died of a broken heart, literally after, after his wife passed away. And um, he just couldn't understand why people who lose somebody then, you know, that just understanding that how grief works, I guess, basically is what it boils down to. It's very complicated. But um, so he just wanted to tell a story about life and love and loss. Um, and out of that came came new life, um, which is fictionalized. But I think we pulled a lot from people that we had known who had dealt with similar circumstances. Um, we were inspired a lot by how they had um, coped with, you know, in the face of something as terrifying as, as mortality. Right. Um, and yeah, the head shaving was my idea. Um, nobody, nobody convinced me to do it. I think I had a moment of insanity, uh, where, because I was also a producer on the film, right? So when you're a producer, you're always like, how do we save money? How do we save money? And one of the line items in the budget was for these very expensive bald caps that that look real um, because I was big on, I don't want that fake bald alien head looking bald cap. Um, and they were so expensive. And I finally just, I looked at, at Drew and I was like, look how much money it would save us if I would just get over my vanity and, and let us shave my head. And so then it just kind of, Fell that as soon as I said it out loud, it was like you know so many women lose their hair not voluntarily, um, and they can't they can't control that, and and it is such a huge part, of, particularly of a, of a woman's identity and sort of what we associate with being beautiful. And I just thought, you know, I'm not doing anything heroic here. I'm not, you know, I'm not actually fighting an illness. Um, I'm just trying to tell a story story and tell it authentically and the only thing standing in the way is my own personal vanity so you know what's that worth um so yeah but it was uh it was a great experience I tell women all the time like oh you should do it you should absolutely do it it's very freeing it's very weird to take a shower um <laughs> it's very weird to lay your head on a pillow um but it's very freeing it really helped me redefine I think my own standard of, of beauty for myself for sure. Well, we all know Will Smith's thoughts on it. So just <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And my husband would not have punched somebody if they had commented on it. So. <laughs> I think you pulled off a little bit better than Jada does though. Aaron, <laughs> <laughs> she pulls it off great. That's why I don't understand all the, she all does, the she does. Oh no, but she just deserves all the shade now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Kev. Yeah, so I'm assuming you grew up in, in the Sherwood Baptist Church. Your dad's been the pastor there, um, and they have Sherwood pictures. Um, She's a PK. She's a I PK. Am. Right. So how did, how did that all come about? Like, how did that church decide, like, hey, let's, uh, let's make some big films? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny because actually, w weirdly, a lot of these, like, origin stories happen in Orlando, which is not it's like six hours from Albany. <laughs> um, but uh, my dad has always been, um, as a pastor, and particularly a Southern Baptist pastor, um, he's always been a bit of a rebel. Um, <laughs> and he's always kind of just done what he believes is, is right, um, regardless of if it seems insane or if people are saying otherwise or whatever. Um, and so shortly after the Southern Baptists boycotted Disney, uh, my dad took his staff to Disney World. <laughs> and uh, mostly because he's a huge Walt Disney fan. He just loves that the guy was a dreamer and a visionary and 
um, that, you know, thinking about future generations and that sort of thing. I think that's always been inspiring. Um, and so while they were on this sort of staff retreat, staying in Orlando and, and at the parks and just sort of enjoying hanging with each other, I think, um, he, he was pulling each of the staff members aside and just saying, you know, what's your vision? What, what, what would you do if anything was possible? You know, that sort of thing. And Alex Kendrick was the media minister at the church at the time, which is just hilarious now to think about that Alex's main job was to make like the Sunday morning announcement videos <laughs> and wow. things like that. Um, so he was the media minister at the church. And, and he, so he asked Alex the question and Alex said, this is going to sound crazy, but I think I would make feature films that teach the gospel. And my dad, just being the Walt Disney lover, anything is possible person that he is, said, well, bring me a budget, bring me a script. Let's see if we could do it. Um, and that's how Flywheel happened with, you know, I think $20,000 was, was what Flywheel cost to make. Wow. And, um, and I think it's just, you know, my dad says still, he, he always says, I know that we, that Sherwood wasn't the first church that God laid it on somebody's heart to make faith-based films. We're just the first ones who said yes and followed obediently. Um, and I think there's a great lesson there, you know, that, um, that all, all that it takes to sort of make a difference in the world is to say yes, to not be afraid of being the first one to do it. Well, and you guys, you probably inspired The Chosen because that started with one video made for their church and now it's turned into a oh, worldwide man. phenomenon. So that series is incredible. Love I it, love it. Love it. That's why I wear this hat. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But I, so I know we're catching you kind of in between filming. So let me just get you out of here with this. Um, what can we see you coming out in here in 2023 and beyond? Oh, man. Um, so I have actually two true stories coming out uh, in the next year that I'm really excited about. Um, one is called Adeline, and it's a story about um, uh, basically a horse therapy, a, a horse that works with special needs children. And I play the mother of a, of a son with autism, and he's nonverbal. And my husband is incredibly skeptical about the whole horse therapy he thinks it's like magic and it's you know stupid and and that you know he's sort of a he's he's a pastor and he's sort of in this mindset of like if if he's gonna be healed god will heal him and we don't need to put him in therapy um so he's just this like very close-minded sort of believer and um anyway so of course it's a beautiful beautiful story it's based on true events about this horse that ended up having this just incredible intuition and, and actually saving a few people's lives um so that one's coming out soon. I don't know when, but soon. Um, and then I just finished a sports movie. Um, <laughs> so that'll be a fun one uh, called Never Give Up. That is a true story. It's a period piece um, based on the story of Brad Minns, who uh, at three years old got a terrible fever and lost 90% of his hearing. Um, his parents decided not to send him away to a deaf school and to raise him in the hearing community, to teach him to read lips, to teach him to function. Um, and they taught him to play tennis because it was a sport that he could play without having to wear a helmet so he could wear a hearing aid while he was playing. And he went on to win the gold medal in the Deaf Olympics in 1985. Um, and it's just a true story and just beautiful. And we were honored to have, we had Brad on set with us. Um, and so that was, it was really a fun one to be a part of. So those will both be coming out in the next year. Um, and then later this year, I'm producing a Christmas movie, um, that'll be coming out the following holiday, 2023. So. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Aaron Faye, for joining us tonight. What <laughs> honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate it. Thank you so it. much. This has been fun. I want to remind everybody, hit that subscribe button. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great night.